All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started today with our Grand Rounds uh, conference. For those of you who need the CME code, we do have it at the bottom of the screen here, uh, so please make note of that so you can record and get uh, credit for it. If anyone doesn't get the CME code, just please feel free to email me. I can, I can send that out after the conference as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to UH Cleveland Medical Center Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today. Today we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Baha Arafa as our speaker. Dr. Arafa is an esteemed member of the Division of Endocrinology at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. Dr. Arafa started his education at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, where he earned his medical degree. He then completed internal medicine residency at the University of Massachusetts. He continued his training with a fellowship in endocrinology here at University Hospitals of Cleveland. He has held the rank of Professor of Medicine at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine since 1997. Dr. Arafa is the current chief of the Division of Endocrinology within the Department of Medicine. He also serves as the program director for the Endocrinology Fellowship at our institution. He is the author of over 100 peer-reviewed publications, five editorials, and 35 book chapters. His areas of expertise within endocrinology include pituitary adrenal function and assessment, as well as diseases of that system, the pathophysiology of hypopituitarism, adrenal function during critical illness, and the pharmacology of glucocorticoids. Please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Arafa. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a real thing to uh, give grand rounds for the first time with only five or six attendees. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm glad uh, at least uh, others are listening from a distance, and that's what we need to adapt to uh, with the current uh, environment. Today, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, stress doses of glucocorticoids. And if you notice, I use the word glucocorticoids, not steroids, even though that's what uh, most of you use. And I hope to change your uh, habit to saying glucocorticoids are not steroids. Because the word steroids includes all kinds of other uh, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, testosterone, uh, estrone, estradiol, name it. There are plenty of other uh, steroids uh, in uh, life. So today, actually, I'm going to go over the importance of the adrenal uh, steroids during stress and obviously talk about the changes in adrenal function during uh, stressful events and talk to you about what happens with uh, when people have impairment in function, can they handle stressful events? So uh, to, to go on with uh, the plan for today, I'm going to try to talk about the current practice in stress dosing in patients who need extra supplementation of glucocorticoids, and hopefully try to convince you that what is uh, currently used is uh, empirical, to say the least, and more than likely uh, inappropriate. To start with, let me go over at least some of the uh, uh, changes that you uh, should be familiar with. That is, what is the adrenal cortex like? The adrenal cortex is uh, a very important structure that uh, has uh, three different layers. Uh, from the outermost, the glomerulosa, which is regulated by the renin angiotensin system, and its uh, main function is to produce or synthesize mineralocorticoids. <laughs> the uh, innermost uh, layer is the reticularis, and this is the uh, layer of the uh, cortex that is, uh, we lost the uh, slides now, that is uh, important in the synthesis of adrenal androgens. Now, as you notice, each one of these layers is regulated differently, uh, with the glomerulosa being regulated by the renal angiotensin system, and the fasciculata and reticularis are regulated by ACTH. Now, this becomes important when you talk about uh, the regulations and what happens in people who have different types of adrenal insufficiency. Just to take you back to the old days when, uh, before even the glucocorticoids or mineral corticoids were synthesized, back in 1855 was the time when Edison described the first patients with adrenal insufficiency. And these patients had a primary disease, and they have very characteristic features 
that are actually well described by Addison in 1855, and actually it is the best description of the clinical picture of adrenal insufficiency that you can get, very detailed and profound. Over the years, actually, people became aware that the adrenal cortex is really the most important part of the adrenal gland and not the medulla. The medulla produces catecholamines, but the body has abilities to make catecholamines elsewhere, so it's not as important when it's missing. And then in 1932 was the first descriptions of Cushing's disease, where you have excess glucocorticoids produced by different uh, organs. With, over time, in the late uh, 1940s, actually, was the time when uh, the structure of uh, cortisol was uh, uh, actually known. And from there on, huge studies came about and when uh, cortisol was synthesized in the lab and started uh, actually being used and abused, I should say, in many other areas, as you will see in a few moments. Now, physiologically, the uh, glucocorticoids, and cortisol being the dominant one in the body, has a lot of important physiologic uh, functions, the most important of which is actually gluconeogenesis and hep increasing hepatic glucose uh, production. It has important function in terms of uh, cardiovascular effects, whether it's sodium retention, modulation of and you feel an integrity, and importantly, improving sensitivity to catecholamine. As you will see over time, actually, there are many other subtle uh, benefits or physiologic effects of uh, cortisol. But what most people became aware of eventually is the pharmacologic benefits or uses, I should say, of uh, group of corticoids. And in that instance, uh, higher doses are often used. And over time, newer glucocorticoids were synthesized, and some of these actually have less sodium-retaining properties, such as dexamethasone and uh, prednisone. They're used in many diseases that are too numerous to count, but if you look quickly, you see some of them used in immunosuppression, whether it's uh, for autoimmune diseases or for graft uh, rejection. The most often uh, used is throughout is anti-inflammatory effects and an anti-allergic effect. But over time, actually, it's actually one of the most common used drugs in uh, treating lymphoproliferative diseases, whether it's lymphoma, leukemias, and so on and so forth. Now, with that come side effects. So if you use excess amount of pharmacologic doses or supraphysiologic doses of uh, glucocorticoids, you're going to end up with side effects. The immediate side effects, or the short term, I should say, side effects include insomnia. People who take it actually complain quickly about insomnia. Euphoria, depression, and it varies from one individual to another. Psychosis actually is common. And then the weight gain, increased appetite, and so on and so forth. There's a huge amount of salt retention that you see, particularly in uh, glucocorticoids that have mineral corticoid activity, including prednisone, prednisolone. The least one that has salt retaining activity is dexamethasone. And obviously, the uh, increasing uh, resistance to insulin and the development of diabetes or hyperglycemia comes over uh, time. The longer si term side effects are actually as profound, if not more profound. And there you have hypertension, heart failure in people who are predisposed. You have uh, ulcer disease in the GI tract. You have cataract. Uh, you have myopathy. Practically every patient who is taking longer-term glucocorticoids has a form of proximal uh, myopathy. You already know about the neuropsychiatric uh, complications that we see, and obviously these patients become uh, vulnerable in terms of predisposition for infections. And one of the uh, common infections that we see in these people is fungal infections, and we've seen quite a bit of those. Among the endocrine complications of using excess or supraphysiologic doses of glucocorticoids, 
would be obviously the development of Cushing syndrome with all its manifestations. And in children, growth retardation becomes a big uh, issue. And hypogonadism, diabetes, and so on and so forth. But what is relevant today is to talk about the suppression of the endogenous uh, secretion of uh, glucocorticoids. As you know, the uh, secretion of uh, cortisol from the adrenal cortex is under the effect or stimulus from the hypopituitary, uh, which is also under the influence of the hypothalamus making CRH. So CRH from the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary to make ACTH, which in turn stimulates the adrenal cortex to make cortisol and DHEA, the adrenal androgen. The cortisol itself feeds back at the hypothalamic and at the pituitary level, shutting off the uh, secretion of both uh, hormones whenever there is excess glucocorticoids. So if you happen to provide glucocorticoids from an outside source, such as what we do when we treat patients with exogenous uh, pharmacologic doses, you basically shut off the hypothalamus from making CRH and you shut off the pituitary from making uh, ACTH. So the adrenal uh, cortex uh, over time can atrophy and shrink in size. And when you stop these glucocorticoids suddenly uh, after a prolonged use, you would actually induce a state of ACTH deficiency. So if you look at this again now, you're inducing a form of adrenal insufficiency in people who are, who are you, you're treating with uh, glucocorticoids over a long period of time. So when you lose, uh, when you have adrenal insufficiency, you have a loss of glucocorticoids plus minus other corticosteroids, depending on the cause for that adrenal insufficiency. So if you have an intrinsic disease, that is a disease of the adrenal, you'll end up losing all three steroid forms, that is the mineral corticoids, the glucocorticoids, and the adrenal androgens. But if you have a central disease, meaning ACTH loss or CRH loss, then the uh, mineral cord secretion may actually persist, and therefore these patients are not as vulnerable as those who have primary disease. Now, if you take people who have exogenous glucocorticoid exposure over a long period of time, then when you stop these, they have ACTH deficiency and therefore central adrenal insufficiency. I have to emphasize here that the form of glucocorticoids that is given exogenously is not limited to what we do orally, uh, but it's also common to see uh, patients who develop this particular uh, side effect when they take inhaled glucocorticoids, such as what you do with treating as asthmatic patients, or actually in dermatologic use. A lot of uh, diseases in uh, dermatology may require local glucocorticoids, uh, and that is more than enough to suppress the axis. Now, for us to appreciate what happens uh, when you're missing glucocorticoids, you kind of need to go back and look at what is the role of the adrenal in terms of stress. First of all, how do we combat stress when we're exposed to it? So if you look at what happens to any individual who's exposed to stress, and stress doesn't mean only emotional stress, physical stress, surgery, trauma, uh, intensive care unit visits, and even hospitalization, as you will see in a minute. So the response to this particular stress is quite complex, and it has peripheral and central uh, components that are all interdependent on each other. But the immediate response that you see would be the sympathetic activation. And with longer-term uh, stressful events, you end up in addition to having the sympathetic activation, you have other systems activated that are meant to maintain the stress response and also adjust the metabolic uh, settings for uh, persistent uh, stress to increase gluconeogenesis. 
And among these would be the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activation. So this is kind of one of the main responses that you see within a short period of time to any stressful event. Even if you look at a phlebotomy, if you send somebody to have a blood drawn and the phlebotomist had trouble inserting the vein, you can bet your money that, look, cortisol levels would be actually quite high by the time they get done with the blood draw. So the role of the adrenal cortex became actually well known, and it's best appreciated when you're missing it. Now, why would that happen? Why would you really need the glucocorticoids or the mineral corticoids for that matter during a stressful event? It's because each one of these hormones has physiologic functions that are extremely relevant in maintaining uh, blood pressure, in maintaining uh, gluconeogenesis, in maintaining vascular response to catecholamines and uh, others. In addition, it, the glucocorticoid secretion has uh, an anti-inflammatory effect. And as you may know, one of the main things that you see with uh, septic shock or major uh, illnesses is the development of an inflammatory response. That's where the glucocorticoids actually may help with this as well. I'm moving here. Okay, so if you actually happen to look at what happens when people are uh, critically ill, we've done that actually several years ago, you look at several aspects of adrenal function, one of which, the easiest at least, is just measuring their uh, cortisol level. And you know that during the, uh, any critical illness, you have an increased production of cortisol, and at the same time, you have decreased clearance from the circulation. So if you combine the two together, you'll end up with very high cortisol uh, levels. And obviously, this is driven by a high ACTH, so it's a centrally driven uh, uh, dynamic where you see a parallel increase in ACTH uh, as well. And if you look at the uh, dynamics, they're very different. So take, for example, what happens in uh, people who are uh, critically ill or patients who are hospitalized for pneumonia or uh, other uh, conditions. And we've done that actually a few years ago. And you notice two things. With uh, increasing critical illness or increasing severity of illness, you see that there is an increase in the cortisol level from what you see in normal people in the morning to what you see in actually people who are hospitalized and not critically ill or hypotensive to what you see in people who are critically ill. So as time or as the illness in increases in severity, you will see higher levels of cortisol. The other thing that I'd like you to notice is uh, cortisol having uh, often a diurnal rhythm with higher levels uh, seen uh, usually in the morning. But during a hospitalization or a critical illness, you basically lose that uh, diurnal rhythm altogether. So, now knowing this, how would somebody who is uh, adrenally insufficient or has dysfunction, let's say, without using the word adrenally insufficient, how would they react during a critical uh, illness or a stressful event? Well, we know that the stress is actually extremely powerful uh, stimulus, as you will see in a few moments uh, uh, for activation of the uh, system. But if somebody has partial a ACTH deficiency, that is, they have some ACTH, but it's not complete loss of the hormone, then they would have a suboptimal type of a response, and they get away with it, and they probably, you would not know about it. And they may have a bit of a prolonged uh, course, but they would be fine altogether. But if they have total loss of ACTH, these are the ones who can have a poor response and obviously prolonged course because they don't have any uh, glucocorticoids. Now, one of the signs or symptoms that we look for in people like this 
would be low grade temperature. Low grade temperature is one of the pathognomonic things that we see in the acute setting in patients who have adrenal insufficiency. What about people who have been on glucocorticoids for inflammatory disease treatment or vice whatever? Well, these people have ACTH deficiency, but not necessarily complete, and it all depends on how the glucocorticoids are administered. Are they administered continuously? Are they administered once a day, every other day, and so on and so forth? The drastic difference that you see is in people who have primary disease. These are the ones who get in trouble, and the reason they get in trouble is they cannot make mineralocorticoids. That's what really saves their life. It's not the cortisol, it's the mineralocorticoids. So, these are the patients who would definitely need glucocorticoids. If you take somebody who has primary disease, they definitely have permanent disease, so it's not a reversible possibility. They will require stress dosing all the time. People with central disease will definitely need it, uh, but people who have exogenous exposure to glucocorticoids very often can get away with just giving them what they were taking uh, prior to the illness. Now, now, taking you back or all the way to what the theme of the talk is, you want to stress these people during uh, their critical illness. How do you stress them? What is the current practice nowadays? Well, it is sad to say that it is based on two case reports published in the literature in the 1950s. I'll show you these two case reports. The first case report is uh, titled Adrenal Atrophy and Irreversible Shock Associated with Cortisone Therapy. These were the old early days where cortisone acetate was used to treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis. That was the main theme at the time. If you look at the description in that uh, paper, it says the patient has post-operative uh, shock and was given adrenal extract but did not respond, and he looked flushed and air hunger. To me, that doesn't look at like adrenal insufficiency in any way, shape, or form, even though the autopsy showed that there was an adrenal atrophy. It looks like maybe he had an embolus or he had uh, some form of a respiratory distress. The second case is actually quite interesting. The, the, the title is Fatal Adrenal Cortical Adrenal Insufficiency Precipitated by Surgery During Prolonged Continuous Cortisone Treatment. Again, rheumatoid arthritis patient having surgery and died within uh, 24 hours of uh, surgery. 20-year-old uh, man uh, who uh, had this. The patient was given uh, uh, cortisone acetate until the day before surgery and collapsed soon after surgery. The autopsy showed adrenal hemorrhage plus atrophy. Well, adrenal hemorrhage is a very good reason for primary adrenal insufficiency. And we've seen that actually repeatedly here in people who have other autoimmune diseases, people on uh, antiplatelet therapy, on heparin, and so on and so forth. So this has nothing to do with being on cortisone acetate. And fortunately, this theme got carried away for 50, 60 years now and has not been challenged except in one study that I will share with you in a minute. And based on those two case reports, the two authors suggested that anybody who has been on glucocorticoids should be treated with IBACTH, we don't do that anymore, plus they have to get, be given cortisone acetate daily for surgery. Now this has been modified over the years, and if you look at what happens now, there's absolutely no uniformity in the recommendations. Depending on who trained you, who you talked to, and who taught you, and which book you read, you would probably do a different thing. And even if you look at uh, our endocrine society guidelines, they're poor in my opinion. And if you look at up to date, which is a good source of information for a lot of uh, residents, you will end up seeing recommendations that 
are excessive. For example, there's no clear-cut recommendations, but in a critical illness, they recommend 50 milligram every six hours. In an adrenal crisis, 100 milligram I intravenously, and then 50 Q6. And if I ask any of the uh, house staff, I'm sure I'm going to get different answers depending on their source of uh, education. Now, the, the, the bad thing is this has been going on for a number of years, and it has been at least as uh, late as just last year when there is a review in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, suggesting exactly the same thing that I showed you. Now, the only challenging uh, publication in the literature was this one. And this study actually involved monkeys. 30 or so monkeys were divided into four groups. And uh, three of these groups of seven to eight of each uh, underwent an adrenalectum, bilateral adrenalectum, so they can induce adrenal insufficiency. And one was uh, had sham operation. And then among the three groups that had the adrenalectomy, uh, they wanted to do echolysystectomy on them. So they pre-treated them with either the physiologic dose of uh, glucocorticoids for the monkey, or one-tenth of that, or ten times of that. And what they found was, you know, if you give a, a physiologic dose, the mortality was 14%. It's hard to believe that there is a mortality with cholecystectomy, but that's what it is. I'm sure they did not uh, give the right dose. That's why this time happened. But if you give uh, 10 times as much, you end up with a similar mortality. It's, it's only when you give uh, one-tenth of the dose that's when you get a higher mortality. And the interesting thing here is each one of these people, uh, animals who, were, uh, who underwent the cholecystectomy were given their mineral corticoids. So, so long as you give the mineral corticoid for somebody who has a primary disease, the dose of cortisol does not matter as much. That, that's the missing part in this particular study that was never addressed. So that takes us to what do we do now? We've been living with this. Uh, mystery for uh, about 60, 70 years. First of all, how do we define uh, what is a stress? What, what does it take? Is it the dose necessary to maintain homeostasis and prevent cardiovascular collapse? Maybe that's not a bad definition. So how do we arrive to the right dose to prevent that? It's kind of difficult to quantitate in real life simply because you have different stimuli, different intensities, different duration, and so on and so forth. So it's not as easy to uh, define it. So how do we treat it? Well, there are several ways of doing it. We thought about two ways. One is try to use different doses of glucocorticoids and see which one works, hopefully, you'll be able to get it. But a better and academic approach would be to define what normal is and then take that, try to understand the uh, physiology and pharmacokinetics of uh, hydrocortisone and try to match doses that would come up with at least a dose similar to what you see in uh, people who have normal function. Now, to do that, you have to have a standardized type of uh, trauma or uh, activity or a stress. And we thought, actually, the perioperative period is probably one of the best. So here's what we did. First, we tried the different doses. And when we try different doses, you'll end up with, obviously, very high values of cortisol. So if you give somebody 100 milligram hydrocortisone intravenously, look at the levels that you achieve. You achieve levels in the four, three, 400, and by the end of the six hours, you still have levels above 50. Now, if you go 50 Q6, you'll end up with a peak of about 200 or so. 
but in Nader, that is around 30 or so. And what is something that I wanted to point out is if you give another dose, the second Nader is higher than the first, suggesting that there is stacking over time. So the higher doses are associated with side effects. So actually, one of the uh, uh, comments that I heard repeatedly, so what if you give somebody hydrocortisone excessively? This is safe. It is okay. No, it is not okay. Because we've learned over the years that higher doses are associated with adverse events. And if you actually look at individuals who have been treated with higher uh, doses, you will notice that hyperglycemia is a common feature, hypokalemia is a common feature, and if you have somebody who has heart failure, you can push them into pulmonary edema very easily with the doses that we talked about because of this powerful fault retention that you get. And obviously, secondary infections are not uncommon either. Now, should we go with a lower dose? Well, if you go with a lower dose, and this is 25 milligrams every six hours, well, yeah, you, you do get actually decent levels that are within the range that you see with, uh, in uh, patients in the critical uh, care setting. Well, we decided to kind of look at the other approach, which is the more reasonable and more academic, and that is look at what happens in people who have uh, normal function and undergo a certain uh, procedure uh, or a stressful event such as surgery and define what is expected there. And also look at the pharmacokinetics of multiple doses of cortisol that we often do and find out a dose that fits in whereby you can combine the doses and actually come up with a graph or levels that are similar to what you see in people who have normal uh, function. And then test it out in people who have uh, adrenal insufficiency and require the same uh, type of stress. Well, to start with, we did this study on uh, over 150 patients who have uh, normal function but have undergone surgical procedures. And the surgical procedures are numerous. Any surgery you want. The only exception that we did not include here is uh, open heart surgery. And open heart surgery, we did not do it, not because you need higher doses. It is because you change the volume. Uh, when people have extracorporeal circulation, their plasma volume or the circulation volume increases by at least twice as much. So the levels that you measure are not as meaningful. That's why we didn't do it. So this is the pattern that you see in actually people who have normal function. You would notice that within six to eight hours after surgery, the cortisol levels are average about 40, and then they decline such that by the end of the 24 hours, it's about 20. That's the normal pattern that you see on a regular uh, basis. So we said, well, let's look at uh, people who, have, who are healthy, and we'll give them two doses of hydrocortisone repeatedly. And look at what happens to their levels of the first, at the end of the first six hours and then at the end of the second. So we did that. And if you look at the literature, you'll see that uh, the only available data are after giving a single injection. With a single injection, the half-life is about 1.6, 1.7 hours, and the clearance is about 10 to 15 liters per uh, hour, and the volume distribution is about 30 liters. So we took healthy individuals. We gave them dexamethasone to shut off their own endogenous production, and then gave them two doses of hydrocortisone, six hours apart. And when you give 15 milligrams, at zero and six hours, you notice that you spike a level about an hour later at about uh, 40, and then the nadir at six hours is about 14, 15. So with the second dose, you achieve a higher peak, and the nadir is a bit higher. Now, if you go to the higher dose of hydrocortisone, which is 25 milligrams, 
you achieve a higher dose uh, after the first dose, and that next peak is higher than the first, and the nadir is actually higher with the second dose. So the message you get out of this is, there are two messages. If you give a higher dose, you achieve a higher level, number one. Number two, the second dose is going to be uh, associated with some stacking so that the nadir is going to be higher than the first. And we calculated the half-life there, and if you see that the half-life after the second injection is longer than the one at the first. So that was a very nice uh, feature to help us design a better uh, study. So we looked further at actually what happens in people who have an adrenalectomy. When you have somebody who has a cortisol secreting adenoma and you take that out, the other adrenals is shut down, totally shut down. So if you take that adrenal out, these people become adrenal insufficient acutely and therefore, whatever cortisol they have at the time if you take that tumor out will start dissipating over time. So we use that information to calculate the half-life and what happens. And here's what we got. The cortisol levels diminish or decrease slowly over time, such that by six hours it's way down, which is what you expect. But what is more interesting, at least to me, is the fact that the higher the cortisol level that you started out with, the higher the half-life of that individual, which fits exactly with what we uh, found when you administer the cortisol exogenously. So we took these two pieces of information and decided to come up with a good, at least uh, pharmacokinetically uh, sound uh, plan. Now, have having done research and having been a clinician at the same time helped me figure out that real life is different from doing a research. In real life, if you have somebody who has adrenal insufficiency and they come into the hospital to have that surgery and you tell the uh, anesthesiologist, please give 50 or whatever number you want to give intravenously, there will be problems. Nine out of ten, there will be. The anesthesiologist may not do it, the patient may uh, be delayed, and the surgery may be delayed, and during that time, that individual or that patient is without any glucocorticoids. So you basically need to avoid that particular problem. And to do that, we said, we'll ask these patients to take an oral dose about two to four hours before they come in, and the rationale is to make sure that none of these things that we talked about will get them in trouble. And to find out that when you give the 20 milligram orally, you basically achieve a level about one hour later that's about 30. So if, you, if these patients present to the uh, anesthesiologist two to four hours later, they have very decent values or levels that are almost identical to what you see in healthy individuals walking in to have the surgery. So, so what we did was we take patients who needed surgery, had adrenal insufficiency, well documented, and needed surgery. And the surgery included knee replacement, hip replacement, uh, cholecystectomy, uh, uh, all kind of uh, thoracic and uh, pelvic uh, procedures. And we give them the 20 milligram of hydrocodone by mouth about two to four hours before they come in. And then, based on the study that I showed you in healthy individuals, we gave them 25 milligram every six hours for the first 24 hours. And then, after that, we gave them 15 every six hours. And we had blood drawn to, to make sure that, that we monitor them, we visited them uh, multiple times a day to make sure they're okay. These are the cortisol levels that you see in, in these individuals. And you'll see that the levels that you achieve are actually better or similar to what you normal people would get during the same surgical procedure. And here is the kind of graph that shows the first 24 hours where you see the spike in cortisol that often happens, and you see that all patients who were given this regimen uh, actually have values that are similar, if not higher, than 
what you see in uh, normal uh, individuals. Now, to remind you, actually, we're talking about levels that are quite high. Even though the level is about 30 or 25, that actually is quite high, particularly because when you look at the cortisol in the circulation in healthy individuals, about 75 to 80 percent of it is down to the corticosteroid binding globulin, and about 10 to 15 percent is bound to albumin, and the portion that is free is about 7 percent only. So when you have somebody who is sick, actually, the proportion that is bound to uh, corticosteroid binding globulin is lower. So most of what you're measuring is in the free range. So to make things even more interesting, the physiology of the binding to corticosteroid binding globulin is such that once you achieve a level of about 25 microgram per deciliter of cortisol, everything beyond that is free or bound to albumin because these binding globulins has enough saturated points that any level above that is not bound to the globulin anymore. So we're talking about very high values is the message here. So these patients tolerated it well. We didn't have any side effects and all went home without any problem, no hypotension, no adrenal insufficiency, and so on and so forth. Now, does that apply to critical illness? Now, we use this in a very standardized uh, way because we can't predict when the trauma starts and when it ends. We know when people are going to surgery, so we know exactly when. So can this fit in uh, for patients who are uh, critically ill for a different reason? I think it can, even though we haven't proven it yet, but I think it does make sense that it will. So if you look at the cortisol level in critically ill individuals, the average that you see is way within the range that we've achieved using the 25 milligram every six hours. So we don't need to uh, dwell on this issue anymore. And if you take individuals who've been treated with 25 milligrams every six hours, they actually have levels that are within that range and actually did uh, quite well. So. How do we treat individuals with adrenal insufficiency the last uh, few minutes left? The main principle of therapy is to make sure that you don't overdo it. Overdoing it is not doing you or the patient any uh, favor. Most uh, publications tell you use the higher doses that I already showed you. I don't think they're accurate. I don't think they're helpful. And I think we feel very strongly that the data that we have in critically ill individuals, and now we have with uh, surgical uh, patients after uh, throughout the perioperative period, is are enough to tell us that what we're doing is excessive. And the important message to leave with you is, at times, you are really not treating uh, only adrenal insufficiency, but you may be treating or needing to treat an inflammatory uh, process, such as what you see with septic shock. When you deal with patients with septic shock, uh, like uh, hypotensive, prolonged uh, unresponsiveness to stresses, there you're not, at least in the, in the setting that you see in the intensive care unit, even if somebody does not have a history of adrenal insufficiency. The glucocorticoids that are used, they are a treatment of inflammatory disease. They are not a treatment of adrenal insufficiency at all because uh, these patients are actually perfectly normal before they walk in. And the inflammation that you see is similar to uh, an activation of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or cerebritis or any of that. Now, one of the things that I kind of wanted to touch base with you at the end is uh, when we uh, treat individuals with uh, glucocorticoids, we ignore the fact that uh, the glucocorticoids or any drug that you use for that matter is metabolized in the body. So its metabolism is affected by diseases that individual has or medications that they may have as well. 
I mean, one of the things that we've actually uh, going to publish on is patients who have liver disease. If you take patients with liver disease, these patients cannot metabolize drugs well. If you take people who have thyroid disease, whether it's hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, they cannot metabolize or they over-metabolize drugs. For example, people who have hyperthyroidism will break down their medications faster, and therefore you'll see that the dosing that you use commonly in these individuals should adapt to their state. To give you an example, if you have somebody who has hyperthyroidism, very sick with hyperthyroidism, you're used to giving atenolol or metoprolol once or twice a day. That will never work here because they metabolize the drug much faster. And atenolol or metoprolol, actually we use it three or four times a day to keep up with their increased metabolism. So to take you back to the glucocorticoids, we try to address liver disease. Why? Because that's the site where glucocorticoids are metabolized. So if you're giving somebody uh, a drug such as hydrocortisone that is metabolized by the liver and it does not break it down fast, you would expect that accumulation would be even worse. So we looked at that actually in real life, and you see that when you take people who are uh, healthy and give them dexamethasone so they shut off their secretion, that's the graph of disappearance of cortisol that you see. And if you take the yellow line here, these are adrenally insufficient individuals who are well, but we try to test how they metabolize the 25 milligram of hydrocortisone. It's identical to what you see in normal people. The difference is in people who have liver disease. Liver disease, first of all, you achieve a higher level, and then the disappearance rate is much longer. So you cannot treat people who have liver disease in the same way that you would treat uh, others who have normal liver uh, function. So to impact this even further, if you look at the half-life of cortisol in the circulation, you notice that the uh, half-life in healthy individuals is similar to what you see in people who have normal liver function even though their adrenal is sufficient. They metabolize the drug the same way. But those who have liver failure or liver disease, they actually have a much longer half-life, so you need to adjust the dosing uh, accordingly. So, again, to repeat the same comment that I made earlier, some may say, well, what's the harm in giving more? There is harm in giving more, and the harm is actually quite obvious and well-documented in the literature. Acutely, you will see hyperglycemia, fluid retention. I've seen a lot of patients who actually decompensated uh, from uh, heart failure into pulmonary edema because of higher doses of uh, the glucocorticoids. Now, what we have done over the years is to actually offer some uh, adjustment in hydrocortisone therapy to people who are stressed. Uh, I'm talking about people with adrenal insufficiency, of course. And if they have a minor illness, a viral illness, uncomplicated infection, we ask them to double what they're taking only for two or three days. And if they have no minor uh, surgery, we can ask them to triple the dose uh, over two or three days. But if they have severe illness, critical illness, complicated surgery, we just go with the 25 milligram every six hours, and I think we've had enough data to suggest that this is more than adequate uh, in terms of dosing. To summarize, actually, the uh, notion that what we're doing is uh, great is not accurate. The perioperative dosing that we have now is excessive and unnecessary. And I can tell you I had a lot of pushback when I first raised this as, uh, as an issue. Uh, and uh, now it's actually finding more uh, acceptance to this. And we can adjust the dose as, as we go on, but we don't go beyond the 25 every, uh, milligrams every six hours. And we obviously, for people who are having surgery, we just suggest that 
to avoid delays and make sure that the patient doesn't get into any kind of trouble between the time they leave their home and the time they see the anesthesiologist, make sure they take their all of those uh, in the morning. Thank you very much and appreciate your attention, even though we, we most of you are not here. Thanks, Baha, and thanks for um, your contributions to the literature. A lot of your references were from 2020. And, and we're only in your personal research. We're only in. in uh, this is my latest. Yeah, latest paper. So, um, we, we've been overdosing people. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I just say one thing. You know, I, I sent an email today. I think another major contribution that Dr. Arafat has made to the literature was pointing out that a lot of patients who are critical ill have low albumin and low serum proteins as part of the critical illness. Illness. And back in the day, people were, were getting a cortisol level uh, as part of their evaluation for someone with critical illness, and the cortisol level would be low, and they'd say, oh, they're critical ill, their cortisol level would be high, and they would be labeled as adrenaline insufficient, and then come, you know, be transferred to the nature of the wards and be on you know, in steroids. And then your, your paper in 2004 New England Journal was like, wait a second, it's because there's no protein binding, you measure free cortisol, and they weren't adrenaline insufficient. So another great contribution to the literature. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Sarek, do you have any questions from our audience? or uh, No questions now. If you have any questions, you can doc hail me, or please speak up if you'd like. We can't hear you if you're at home or watching uh, in your office. It's, you know, it's funny how practice patterns get set by a few papers and a few opinion leaders, and they persist for decades. Because this practice pattern of kind of giving high doses of supplemental corticosteroids, you know, when we thought people were, we thought they were, they were doing insufficient, has persisted for decades, and I think your your work is, uh, yeah. So. See, I mean, you're making a very, very important point, and that is uh, for us all to uh, challenge uh, things that don't make sense. And when I first published or I submitted this to the New England Journal of Medicine, they said, oh, it has not been registered for the, uh, uh, what is it? IRB, no. No, no, it's not IRB. It's uh, the website for uh, uh, clinical trials. I see what you're saying. So yeah. it wasn't because the first patient did not get into there. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But this is uh, hopefully uh, uh, something that uh, people would uh, pick on and uh, go on with life. Because this is, to me, uh, a struggle for uh, quite a number of years that we've had, and I had to convince all kind of people, uh, you know, that what we're doing is not necessarily helping uh, patients. That's awesome. And just one more thing. So um, next week for Grand Rounds, we're planning on kind of a COVID-19 Grand Rounds. Our speaker for next week, Dr. Heather Gornick, couldn't do it, just with so much other things going on. And, we hope to have, uh, you know, Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Sade, Dr. Fair, and Dr. Herjal maybe each give like a sort of a 10 or 10 minute update on, on sort of the COVID issues. Um, and Dr. Sarek, do you have questions for Dr. Irfa? No questions yet. Anything okay. from, uh, actually, we have one from the audience here. All right, a real live human being in Kula. Dr. Islam has a question. Just for, for people us. on the uh, Just, uh, go ahead and speak on, on the broadcast, every, there's about six people in Kuras, more than 10 feet apart. My question was, so I know you mentioned um, with septic shock, uh, it's a different state than adrenal insufficiency. So oftentimes in the ICU when we're tapering off, rather than going Q6 hours, I see like 50 going from Q6 for 24 hours and Q8 for 24 hours and Q12 for 24 hours. So is this idea of a nadir um, in a septic shock patient not like, like, does it not drop that low, their cortisol levels, and that's why the interval is different? You had the question, Bob? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, part of the problem in uh, looking at patients with uh, septic shock is we're mixing two different settings. Uh, what most people do in the intensive care unit with septic shock, those patients do not have adrenal insufficiency to start with. So you're, basically, you might as well give them dexamethasone if you want. So you're treating an inflammation. You're not treating an adrenal insufficiency state. And that's something that I hope to keep emphasizing. I mean, unless you're dealing with somebody who has true adrenal insufficiency to start with. My uh, 
common concern that I repeatedly said is if we don't recognize these patients as being okay or healthy or no, has normal adrenal function, what ends up happening, happening is after they leave the intensive care unit, the floor uh, would assume that they have adrenal insufficiency and so on, and put them on whatever appropriate doses they do, and then they become adrenally insufficient, which is obviously our uh, fault. But to answer your question, in terms of the setting of uh, septic shock, uh, you're, since you're treating it to treat an inflammation, so you, your guideline should be the inflammation itself rather than the levels that you achieve. Excellent. Um, okay. any, any further questions from yeah. those watching remotely? Can I uh, thank everyone remotely for muting. I'm sorry if I was a little bit dogmatic in the beginning. It was pretty. It was pretty loud in here when. So I apologize for. Uh, for that. And again, I want to thank again Dr. Arifa, who's, who's uh, made, you know major contributions in this area over the years, and to share it with us, you know here here at the you know UH Case Western VA is really special. Thanks, Baha. Thank so. you.